5G works. So I'm going to instead uh, just give an overview of uh, some of the things that uh, the Commission uh, under Chairman Pai's leadership is doing in the area of next generation uh, emergency communications and public safety. Uh, if time permits, um, and I'm hopeful that time will permit, uh, I'm happy to take some questions at the end. So um, I want to just start. Uh, I work in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau at the FCC, and we actually have a motto. Um, our mission statement is very simple. It's the public's safety is job one. Kind of corny, but we believe it. We really take it, we take it very seriously. Um, we are the Commission's primary experts on public safety and homeland security matters. Um, we develop and implement policies uh, consistent with the FCC statutory authority uh, to serve this mission. And let me talk a little bit about some of the things that we focus on. Some of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, what, what uh, particular activities does the Commission engage in with respect to public safety? Well, some of the things that we are uh, working on, uh, have been working on for a number of years and continue to, uh, number one, uh, 911, uh, helping ensure that anybody who needs to call 911 can do so uh, and be located by first responders. Um, Another area is emergency alerting. Uh, we uh, regulate the provision of emergency alerts by commercial providers. Um, we don't originate alerts, uh, but um, when those alerts come to you over your television, your radio, your cell phone, uh, we regulate those providers in the way in which they uh, uh, deliver alerts to you. So another part of our mission is to strengthen that alerting system uh, and provide better tools for the emergency managers that use it. Um, Another function is uh, simply promoting the resiliency and reliability of communications networks, whether they're used by public safety or by the public. Um, we uh, deal with trying to make those networks more robust uh, as technology changes, as threats to technology evolve. Uh, we'll, we deal a lot with uh, physical uh, threats to uh, networks uh, from uh, wildfires, hurricanes, floods, and the like. Uh, but we also deal with uh, uh, threats to the technology that could come from uh, uh, a cyber attack or from uh, simply mismanagement of the network, uh, often just uh, what we call sunny day outages that can be caused by something as simple as uh, a company decides to do a maintenance upgrade on a piece of software in a system and lo and behold, uh, when they do it, the whole system goes down. So those kinds of issues recurrently come up. Uh, and then finally, uh, both preparing for and responding to disasters to promote con continuity of communications. Um, our work includes regulatory action. If you were at Eric's presentation, you saw that chart where he described uh, the legal framework, the administrative process, the appeals process. I work in that space, that green APA area that he described. That's, that's where I spend most of my, uh, my day. Um, but we use a lot of other tools as well because we work, we have to work collaboratively with a lot of stakeholders. There are certain entities that we regulate. We regulate commercial carriers, cell phone companies, broadcasters, and the like. Um, but we also work with a lot of uh, organizations, uh, including the local 911 call centers, uh, which we do not regulate, but we work with them to try to develop our policies. Uh, and we work with technology innovators. And uh, I will underscore uh, and echo what Eric said, which is input from the technology community in our processes is incredibly valuable, incredibly important. I've worked with some of the best technologists in the business. Uh, some of them, Henning and Eric, are here in the room, and I've been delighted to be associated with them. And their input when they are at the commission has been in incredibly valuable. Uh, and the input of technology uh, experts outside the commission also really helps us uh, to come to the right decisions. So I'm going to just highlight a few things, uh, areas that the Commission has worked in in the past year to improve public safety. Um, I'm going to start with Kerry's Law and Ray Bombs Act. Uh, Eric talked a little, little bit about that earlier today. So let me just give you an overview of, of where we are with that. In August, the Commission adopted a sweeping order uh, that implements these two new federal laws uh, that improve key elements of the 911 system. The first is Kerry's Law, and as most of you know, but if you don't, Kerry's Law was uh, enacted in response 
to a really quite simple technical problem that had an incredibly tragic outcome. Um, Carrie Hunt uh, was a woman in Texas who was attacked and killed in her hotel, hotel room uh, in 2013. Her young daughter was in the room at the time. She tried to call 911 from the room repeatedly, and she couldn't get through because she did not know that in that hotel at that time, you had to dial nine to get any kind of outside line, even if you were dialing 911. Um, so that tragedy uh, led to uh, Carrie's father, Hank Hunt, making it a personal mission to change the law uh, and to change the practice uh, in, uh, with these types of systems. Uh, he worked with Chairman Pai, he worked with Mark Fletcher, uh, and with a lot of others, uh, and, but almost uh, you know, Herculean efforts to uh, change uh, the law and change the practice and to uh, pass a law that would require multi-line telephone systems, what we call MLTS, um, to support 911 direct dialing, to simply take that prefix off the number so that if you dial 911, you will get to 911. Um, a number of states before the federal law was passed passed their own laws with such requirements. And then in February of 2018, Congress passed the federal version of Kerry's law, and that became part of the Communications Act, which is the commission's governing statute. So that then became a law that the commission is empowered to implement and enforce. And that version of Kerry's law, the federal version, uh, requires all multi-line telephone systems uh, that are manufactured, sold, or installed uh, in the U.S. after February 2020 to support 911 direct dialing. The law also requires systems, these systems to provide an internal notification uh, when a 911 call is made, such as to a front desk or to a security office, to facilitate the building entry by first responders. And uh, it's important to underscore that when we talk about multi-line telephone systems, we are also talking about IP-based and cloud-based systems that functionally do the same thing as a traditional multi-line telephone system. So this is not just a law that regulates uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, circuit switch telephones. Um, so in August, the Commission adopted rules that implement Kerry's law, and uh, between now and the February 2020 implementation date, uh, when the requirements go in, into effect, um, we are encouraging all entities that are affected by the law, uh, governed by the law, manufacturers, installers, and operators of these systems to, number one, understand what the legal uh, obligations are under the law, and to make sure their systems have those required 911 capabilities. And the good news is the technology to do this is already out there. Uh, it's widely available in the marketplace, so compliance is not difficult or costly. Now, the second law that was uh, enacted about a month after Kerry's law was Ray Bombs Act. That was enacted in March of 2018, and a particular section of that act, Section 506, called on the commission to look broadly at improving 911 location uh, for all communications platforms. Uh, and specifically, uh, the law directed us to look at the feasibility of, uh, of having what we call dispatchable location conveyed to a 911 consenter, center with each 911 call. And dispatchable location, it's a term of art in the public safety community. It is what first responders refer to as the gold standard for having knowledge ahead of time of where somebody is uh, that they need to reach in response to a 911 call. Uh, typical example, if uh, someone is calling 911 from a building, uh, let's say a multi-story building in a, from an apartment, from an office in that building, um, dispatchable location means you not only know the building, you know the floor, you know the apartment or the office number, so you know the precise location uh, of the caller inside that building. Um, and in, in, in August, as part of the same order, Congress um, adopted dispatchable location rules for uh, a number of different platforms, for multi-line telephone systems, uh, for fixed telephone service, which already effectively provides dispatchable location, but nonetheless, we included them in the rules because we wanted it to be comprehensive. Um, interconnected voice over IP uh, and uh, telecommunications relay services and mobile texting services. And those platforms combined probably account for about 60 million 911 calls a year nationally. Um, so what the rules require is that if a 911 call is made from a fixed device from one of those platforms, um, the rules require automatic delivery of dispatchable location to uh, the call center that the call is sent to. Um, 
for those that come from no mobile or nomadic devices, and of course these devices are increasingly uh, mobile and nomadic, uh, the rules require delivery of automatic dispatchable location if it is technically feasible. But if it's not, then service providers still have to provide alternative location information, such as a coordinate-based uh, location, um, that identifies the caller's approximate location. Um, and we made the rules flexible. We provided alternatives because we wanted uh, to be sure that even if first responders didn't know the exact dispatchable location of a person in a building, knowing the approximate location of that caller, um, such as what floor they're on, such as what quadrant of a building they are in, um, that can save minutes in getting to that person. And minutes matter uh, when you're talking about first response, uh, particularly in medical emergencies, but really in all emergency. The faster first responders can get there, even if it's a matter of seconds or minutes faster, uh, the better off everyone is. So those requirements are going to take effect uh, in a year for the fixed services, two years uh, for mobile and nomadic services. Uh, once the rules become effective, and they should be effective uh, quite soon, we have to publish them in the Federal Register because before they formally become effective, but that process is underway. Um, and we took the approach that we've generally taken with respect to location requirements, which is the rules are both technology-driven but also technology-neutral. They're technology-driven in the sense that as part of the rulemaking process, and this is why getting contributions from the technology community is so important, we need to know what is possible, what is actually already being done or what's being worked on in the technology world so that we can have a general understanding of what is technology capable of doing now and in the future uh, so we have an understanding of how much these technological changes might cost to implement. Um, so that's important information to have. Um, but we also, as a matter of policy, uh, make our rules technology neutral in the sense that what we do is we say, okay, based on what we, where we think technology is and it's going to be, here's what we think is a reasonable target, a functional requirement for 911 location. That's the target. That's the goal. And you can use any technology or combinations you want to achieve that goal. We're not going to tell you which technology is the right one to choose. That's really uh, something that the technology community is much more expert on than we are. Um, so, as a result of these regulations, we, what we hope to see, and I think we are seeing, is a lot of companies that are already trying to solve these problems, but we would like a broader community of innovators to look at how do we come up with common technological approaches to location uh, when we're talking about environments like office buildings, uh, apartments, campuses, shopping and entertainment complexes, transportation hubs. So that is one piece of our 911 portfolio uh, where uh, we've taken significant action recently. And then we also have for a long time focused on uh, location accuracy for wireless, for, for cell phones. Um, that represents uh, probably 75 to 80 percent of the 911 calls that are made nationwide every year. It's about 180 million wireless 911 calls a year. Um, we've had location accuracy rules on the books for actually for a couple of decades since uh, cell phones first became ubiquitous and people started using them to call 911. But we updated those rules in 2015 in order to address the issue of wireless calls, particularly from indoor locations, because as people cut the cord uh, and as uh, cell phones and smartphones become more ubiquitous, more and more calls were coming from indoor locations uh, where the technologies that have been implemented um, in the first generation of cell phones, like GPS, would not work to locate the caller. Um, so we have rules already that require wireless carriers to meet an increasingly stringent series of location accuracy benchmarks um, that apply to both outdoor, indoor and outdoor calls. Um, like the rules that we just adopted for Ray Bombs Act, um, our wireless rules also provide for dispatchable location. Uh, so they encourage the provision of location uh, by dispatchable location. But we also allow and have benchmarks for coordinate-based location, um, provided it meets our accuracy benchmarks. Um, that is uh, sufficient for carriers to comply with the rules if dispatchable location isn't possible. And those or these are horizontal accuracy requirements for, for now. Um, and the degree of difficulty, the, the sort of the height of the goalposts, 
uh, for the carriers is increasing over time. Uh, we have benchmarks coming up in 2020 and 2021 uh, that are going to require carriers to deliver horizontal accuracy uh, within 50 meters for 70 percent and then 80 percent of all wireless calls. Um, the other piece of this uh, is one we're working on now. Um, last March, uh, the Commission issued what we call a further notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, in Eric's chart where we, they talked about rulemaking, sometimes when we do a rulemaking, we adopt an order, we also say, well, maybe we should ask some more questions about what the next phase is going to be. And that's what the further NPRM was. Uh, and this was to tackle an issue that we had left open in 2015, uh, in the 2015 order. And this is how do you establish an accuracy metric for a wireless call in a multi-story building where you not only want to know their XY, their horizontal location, you want to know what we call the Z-axis, what floor are they on? Because um, vertical location information, again, by helping to identify the floor where the call occurred, that can reduce emergency response times and save lives. Um, so uh, after 2015, we told the carriers to start testing vertical accuracy solutions. Uh, and in fact, we ha the industry created a test bed, uh, which showed the potential of using a particular technology based on barometric pressure sensors, um, which are a standard component now of most smartphones to provide vertical location. Um, but we also note and uh, are interested in other technologies that may, may support vertical location. So in the further notice, um, this is back in March, the Commission uh, proposed that wireless providers meet a vertical location accuracy metric. Um, and the metric that we proposed is plus or minus three meters relative to the handset. So if you make a wireless call, 911 call with a handset, um, the information that's provided um, through the handset and the network should provide the vertical accuracy within plus or minus three meters, which is, uh, it, it's, it's sufficient in some, maybe not all cases, to deliver floor level accuracy. But it will at least, if you're in a multi-story building, a plus or minus three meter standard will eliminate a lot of floors where first responders don't need to look. Um, so that was the proposal. Um, we, um, received a lot of comments on this proposal, that comment process that we talked about. Um, and of course, I'd love to tell you what the Commission is going to do, but I can't. Um, I can assure you we're working hard on it. We're working hard on it right now. When I go back to the office tomorrow, this is what I'm going to be working on. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, there, will, there will be more on this, and I hope so. Um, even as we're deciding what accuracy standards to adopt in our rules, though, my message to the technology community would be don't just look at what the FCC rules require. Um, the two important things to remember about our rules, first, they set a floor on what is required. They do not set a ceiling on what is possible or what we would like to see. Um, and second, they're technology neutral, which means we're leaving it wide open uh, for innovators to improve on the performance that we require as a baseline um, and to explore uh, new and novel uh, approaches uh, that can go, again, across platforms. Um, I, I like to think of, when we're talking about indoor location, uh, coming up with solutions that can work regardless of the kind of device that the person uses to call 911. Uh, if I'm in my office and I need to call 911, I could use my cell phone. I could use my desk phone. They go on different networks. Um, they are, are, are transported to 911. Uh, hopefully, they go to the same 911 center. Uh, and, but di very different things happen right now depending on which device I use. And ideally, it shouldn't matter. Whatever tools are available to provide more precise location should be in play and activated whether you're making a cell call or a call from your desk phone. Either way, it's the same problem that needs to be solved. And there are no constraints on the imagination of technology innovators to try to solve that. Uh, historically, They've always delivered. I think they can do it again. And that will help us. It will also help the 911 community and the public. So let me switch gears just quickly and talk about a couple of other areas. Um, one is wireless emergency alerts. Um, this is kind of the flip side of 911. This is not how the public calls for help. This is how uh, do emergency managers, emergency agencies inform the public about dangers and perhaps how to avoid uh, or respond to those dangers. So we have two systems. 
Um, wireless emergency alerts, those are the emergency alerts that are delivered on cell phones and other mobile devices. Um, the WIA program has been in place uh, since 2012. Um, it's proven to be a lifesaver in a lot of cases. It warns people about imminent dangers like tornadoes, flash floods, uh, wildfires. It's also used for things like amber and silver alerts, so it alerts the public to help in finding a child or a senior citizen that's missing. Um, and the technology, even since 2012, has enabled us to take a series of actions to improve the delivery uh, and the content of those WIA alerts. So just a couple of examples. Uh, wireless providers must now support uh, clickable links in WIA alerts, which means in addition to just getting a text message, you get a URL um, that you can click on that may provide additional information. Um, we're also uh, expanding the length of uh, uh, the, the, the number of characters that can be included in a wireless emergency alert. The original system was subject to a 90 character limit, so it's a pretty short text message. Uh, that's being increased uh, to 360 characters. Um, and we'll also support messages in multiple languages. Um, we'll also support wireless emergency alert testing um, and the ability to provide messages that convey uh, recommended actions to the public. So not just a tornado is coming, take shelter, but maybe information about where shelters are. Um, these improvements will become available when FEMA, which also has a role in this uh, through its IPAWS system, which is the gateway system through which alerts are sent, um, is ready to support all of these improvements. So we're all uh, waiting anxiously for FEMA to declare that that capacity is implemented in IPAWS. Um, another area uh, that we're working on, and again where technology has significantly improved performance, is geographic targeting of alerts. Uh, emergency managers, they always emphasize to us that wireless emergency alerts need to be very carefully targeted. So they re reach the people at risk in affected areas, somebody in the path of a tornado, but they don't go to the public in places that are outside that area of risk because if you don't have precise geotargeting, what you tend to see is alert fatigue. People start ignoring the alerts and that can reduce their confidence uh, in the alerts and the trust in the warnings. So since WIA was first launched, um, we have seen improvements in technology that support geotargeting, uh, and we're requiring wireless carriers over time to implement those advances uh, and increase the precision of the geotargeting of the alerts they send. So originally in 2012, our, our rules said that you had to uh, geotarget alerts at the county level, but you didn't have to uh, require targeting within a county. There are a lot of counties out there that are big. I, I come from Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a big county. So uh, targeting an alert to all of LA County is going to get you about 10 million people, which is probably not the audience you're looking for. Um, in 2017, we tightened the rules um, to require wireless providers to transmit to a geographic area that best approximates the area of the emergency. But we didn't uh, in any way constrained if there was an overshoot we didn't we didn't constrain that but now we're tightening the rules further and beginning uh, at the end of November uh, wireless providers will have to provide uh, wireless emergency alerts in the area that the alert originator specifies so the alert originator says this is where the alert needs to go um, and the alert needs to be targeted to that area with no more than a tenth of a mile overshoot um, so that's going to be much more precise um, we think this is going to make uh, alerts more effective in targeting, uh, not only those that need to receive them, uh, but also it will help to reduce a, uh, alert fatigue because people who don't need to see them won't. Uh, but again, we're very open. Technology, if technology pushes the envelope further, uh, that's great. If we can do even more precise geotargeting, um, then that's, that's a good thing. So this is another area where we would encourage technology not just to do what the FCC rule requires, but to see whether you can exceed that. Um, we're also, uh, let me talk finally about, about 911 resiliency and reliability, um, because this is another uh, priority of the Bureau in promoting uh, resiliency and reliability of communications networks. Um, we're, we're concerned about, nine, about, about communications networks. Gen generally, we're particularly concerned about 911, that 911 always needs to be there for the public. Um, 
So, but there are also outages, and when those outages occur, such as during disasters, we work with uh, government partners uh, at the state and local level, at the federal level, and with industry and uh, to support service restoration. Um, and then after the disaster, we investigate so that we can apply the lessons that we've learned to improve future preparation and response. Um, just a couple of examples that I'll give uh, before closing. Um, earlier this year, uh, Lisa Folks, who is our bureau chief, my boss, uh, she traveled to Northern California to meet with public safety officials in Northern California, um, from whom she learned firsthand uh, about the threats uh, to communications posed by wildfires. Well, this has been in the news. Um, California energy providers are now implementing planned power outages as a fire prevention measure uh, in areas where the wildfire risk is, is high. Anticipating that, uh, Lisa sent letters to the nation's largest uh, wireless providers saying you need to tell us what steps you're taking to keep wireless service available in the event of one of these power shutdowns. And we got responses from all the carriers and they are all public and you can read them. Um, we're also uh, reaching out to California public safety entities, uh, communication providers and power companies to see how we can help improve coordination uh, in the future. Our goal, uh, I don't think we're there yet, but our, our, our goal is to ensure uh, that communications networks stay on when the power is shut off. Um, there's a lot of progress that's been made uh, in that area, but there's always more that can be done. And the other example illustrates this. Um, a year ago, Hurricane Michael um, inflicted enormous damage on a lot of communities in the southeastern United States, uh, particularly in the Florida Panhandle. Um, and at, a lot of things worked right. 911 responded pretty well. Where there were 911 failures, calls could be transferred from one PSAP to another. Um, so we, it underscored some of the lessons we've been trying to, to inculcate that it, redundancy, root diversity are really important for the resilience of, of 911 service. But not everything worked the way it should. And so although wireless service in most areas affected by Michael was restored, uh, fairly quickly, within a few days. The recovery was a lot slower in a couple of counties in Florida. Um, the Bureau investigated that. We released a report in May. Again, uh, you can find it on our website. Um, and it found that there were three factors that led to the slower, uh, the really unacceptably slow restoration of wireless service in those areas. Uh, the factors were uh, lack of resilient backhaul connectivity, um, inadequate roaming arrangements. Um, roaming was supposed to happen, but the arrangements hadn't been made to activate it. Um, and also lack of coordination between wireless service providers, power crews, and municipalities in the restoration effort. So one of the things that happened several times was that uh, backhaul was not destroyed by the storm, but it was impaired by repair efforts at, after the storm because somebody would come in with a backhoe to clear trees and debris, and in the process, they cut the cable, the fiber that uh, provided the backhaul. Um, we did find in our report that some providers had not lived up in practice to the principles of a voluntary agreement that they had entered into in 2016. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, often we look for ways for industry to do voluntary, uh, make voluntary commitments to uh, improve service, and those work uh, in some instances. But we found in this case um, that some of the uh, principles of the framework had not been lived up to. Uh, so we're re-examining re that framework. Uh, we want to ensure uh, that wireless providers are meeting communi community needs uh, and doing everything they can to restore service after a natural disaster and also to prepare for it more effectively uh, to shorten those periods when power uh, and when, when service is down. So again, this is an ongoing process. I can't tell you where it will lead us, uh, but uh, each time we have uh, go through a disaster, and uh, I don't think we're going to run out of disasters. Um, we try to apply the lessons learned and figure out what is the best course to take next. And underlying all of this is technology, which is changing. I, I came to the commission in 1992, um, which as far as I'm, my kids are concerned, might as well have been dinosaurs roaming around. Um, so, and from a technology point of view, an enormous uh, amount has happened. And the technology changes we've seen, they've got the potential to yield a lot of benefits for public safety, but they also present challenges. And so that's why we need input from technology experts as well as others, um, so that we can be sure that we're taking advantage of every opportunity technology gives us 
but that we're also developing rules that will ensure or at least uh, move in the direction of uh, using it effectively uh, and uh, particularly um, in areas like uh, access to uh, access to 911 location accuracy first and, and emergency alerting. So that's what we are working on. We're looking forward to working with you to save lives uh, and build safer communities. And that is uh, all I have to say other than thank you. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.